So let's recall where we were yesterday. So we left off at the point where I indicated that there's a general method now by which we can prove that the cuspidal region of the fundamental domain in which, you know, which is kind of informally defined as the, as the, as the place with a, with a, give me a second. It's a little annoying because I can hear myself on my second device and I want to stop that. All right, so, so last time we showed that at least, I mean, we, we discussed a general strategy by which you can show that for each of these pairs, Gn comma Vn, we can, we can demarcate the fundamental region into a main body and a cusp. So let F be a fundamental domain for the action of G and Z on G and R. And what we showed yesterday implies the following thing. Suppose we are trying to count the number of G and Z orbits on V and Z. I'll say plus minus because we're just restricting to either discriminant positive or discriminant negative. We're only counting the R soluble points. And we're only counting the irreducible points where a point is said to be irreducible if it has zero discriminant and it does not correspond to the identity element in the Selma group. So all the identity elements, they're all reducible elements and they go up in the cusp. We are not counting in the cusp. We're only counting in the main body. So we're left only with the reducible elements. And we're counting with height less than X. Then it turns out that this, I mean, what we, what we did yesterday implies that the volume of the fundamental domain approximates this because, because the error term was small. So this, the asymptotics of this are exactly that, are exactly the volume of the fundamental domain. So how did we construct the fundamental domain? So the fundamental domain we constructed was simply uh, Fn dot this Rx that we had. Okay. And so all, so what we had was simply volume of fn dot rx, except fn dot rx wasn't, wasn't, um, so I should say rx plus minus because we're restricting to the positive or disc negative discriminant. But the thing is that fn dot rx wasn't actually a, a fundamental domain. It was a cover of a fundamental domain. And, and, and each orbit was being represented by the, by the size of the stabilizer. So you divide by the size of the stabilizer, but from our previous parameterization result, we know that the stabilizer is exactly equal to the two torsion of the corresponding elliptic curve. So I'm going to write this stabilizer as one divided by the size of E plus minus R two. And when I say plus minus, I mean you either take an elliptic curve of positive discriminant or take an elliptic curve of negative discriminant, depending on whether you know you're counting points of positive or negative discriminant. And uh, the, the two torsion subgroup of an elliptic curve of R doesn't depend on anything other than the sign of which is discriminant. And so, sorry, uh, this should be n torsion. And so this is exactly, these are exactly the asymptotics, piecing together everything we did in parts one and two. These, these are the asymptotics. Okay. So now we have a bunch of work left to do, unfortunately. And, 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 and that's because we we, we're counting too much. We're counting too many elements. So what do we actually want? So what are the issues that show up? First of all, we want only locally soluble elements. Now we've already imposed R solubility, that's good. However, we are counting elements that are insoluble at primes. We haven't taken them out yet. So we need to, 
we need to somehow remove all the elements that are not locally soluble at primes. The second thing is, here we're counting G and Z orbits on V and Z. We don't want that. We want G and Q equivalence classes. And not G and Z, and not G and Z orbits. So imposing both these conditions will actually decrease our answer because we want, we'll be throwing out elements that are non soluble, and they could be multiple G and Z orbits that collapse into a single G and Q equivalence class. We're overcounting those right now. We want to count only one of those orbits, not all of them. So these are the two things that we have to do. Okay. So how are we going to do that? So first of all, local solubility is a nice condition because it's a periodic condition. Like local solubility is just one condition at every prime p. Like if you want to, if you if you're trying to count lattice points weighted by some random function. It, th that function better have a nice structure, otherwise we can't do it, right? I mean, you can't just count some arbitrary function, some dual lattice points. So the fact that you're locally soluble, uh, the fact that the condition of local solubility is just a condition at every p, and so that's that's perfectly that's a nice condition that we should really. It's still not immediate how to count those, but at least it's a nice it's a local condition. What about the second issue? How do we count G and Q equivalence classes instead of G and Z orbits? So the problem is that you can have a single, you could, you could have multiple G and Z orbits that all become Q equivalent. There's no way to pick one orbit over the other orbit, right? Like they're all like, these are all natural things. So, so, so what are we going to do instead of counting by, instead of trying to somehow pick one of these orbits and say, we'll only count points in that orbit. Let's instead weigh each point by one divided by the number of orbits that collapse into a G equivalence class. Okay. So, so the way we're going to do this is for each F, in VZ, we're going to take the G equivalence class. So I'm going to take, um, sorry, I'm going to suppress the N if you don't mind, uh, and, and just write, and just write, uh, so G comma V is equal to G N comma V N. So if we have an element in VZ, well, Let's let's look at its G equivalence class. So what is the G equivalence class? You take G Q dot F, but we're only counting integer elements. So, so we take G, G Q dot F intersect VZ. So this is the G equivalence class of F inside V inside VZ. Now, if this is a single G Z orbit, then, then great. Then we're in good shape because we, we are counting GZ orbits, and if the G equivalence class is the same as a as the GZ orbit, if the G equivalence class is the same as the GZ orbit, then 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 everything is good. However, this this might not be the case. Now it's pretty easy to check that this is this is at most going to be a finite set, but it can be a finite set with multiple elements. In fact, the number of elements you can have in the set is not bounded. You can have arbitrarily large. G, GZ orbits collapsing into a single equivalence class. So let's give this let's give this a name. Let's call it B of F. Okay. Let's call it B of F. So what we want to do, we want to count weighted orbits where each F is weighted by let's call it n of f which is by definition uh, the size of b of f inverse that's what we 
you want to do. Um, sorry, let, let me actually, let me actually, um, let me actually change notation a little bit, sorry. I'm not sure exactly what we use, but, but this is a little bit more convenient. So we want to weigh each F by one divided by N of F, where N of F is the number of elements in BF. Okay, but this is some pretty random, pretty random function. NFF is, you know, like, like how are you going to describe NFF? So what we want to do next is we want to weigh by something local. Like we want functions that are essentially the product of periodic function. Because those weights are just easy to handle analytically. There are civ methods that can handle local conditions, but just some random function you, you, can't, you can't weigh by. So how do we make N of F into something local? So what we do, and by the way, I just want to say one thing. I'm writing this for these, for these four representations, G2, G3, G4, and G5 acting on V2, V3, V4, and V5. But this procedure that, that we develop works, works in much greater generality. It works pretty much for any representation. And in fact, there've been a whole host of other applications where, where people have studied arithmetic statistics of hyperelliptic curves and um, all sorts of other curves. And, and you can just use these techniques uh, to, to deal with going from GZ orbits to GQ equivalence classes. So I should say that in, that in previous works, like for example, if you look at Davenport's work on studying cubic, on counting binary cubic forms, which then Davenport and Heilbron used to count cubic fields, the way you used to do it was you try and give an interpretation of the GZ orbits. If you can understand the GZ orbits, then you can, you can understand which orbits to keep and which orbits to throw out. Here, somehow, we don't have an interpretation of the GZ orbits. We only, we only know what the GQ equivalence classes mean. So we need a more general technique. We can't study the GZ orbits and decide which ones to throw out. We have to, we have to sort of, we have to work here without the parameterization. And, and this method, you'll notice, doesn't use anything about the parameterization. So here's the idea. The idea is that instead of weighing by one divided by NF, we will instead weigh by one divided by M of F, where M of F is going to be a slight modification of N of F. So, so here's, here's what M of F is. So it's going to be similar. We're going to sum over elements in B of F. If you remember, B of F is just you know, a set of representatives for the action on GZ on the GQ equivalence class of F. So we're going to sum over elements in B of F, but instead of summing one, if we had summed one, we would just get N of F, right? So instead of summing one, we're going to sum something a little bit more subtle. We're going to study the, we're going to sum the size of the stabilizer group of G defined over Q. So the stabilizer in GQ, sorry, I should, I should say stabilizer in GQ, mod the stabilizer divided by the stabilizer in GZ, uh, so I've written stab Q of F because stab Q of F is equal to stab Q of G, I could write either one. Over Q, sorry, over, 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 over Q, F and G are, so F and G are GQ equivalent, so they must have the same Q stabilizer. They need not have the same Z stabilizer. They can definitely have different Z stabilizers. So we just weigh from, we just weighed by this by the sum instead. So instead of, instead of instead of just summing one, we'll sum this quantity m of f. We'll we'll we'll, we'll make this new function m of f, and weighting by one divided by m of f instead of one divided by n of f gives us basically the same answer, because for most forms, stab q is actually trivial. For most forms, there is no stabilizer, the stabilizer is trivial, which means, which means this, this different 
this different weighing doesn't actually affect the asymptotics at all. However, this different weigh, weight has the wonderful property of actually being a local product. So if, if instead, so if, if, if you take F, instead of taking it inside V of Z, let's, let's, let's take it inside V of Z P and let's define D P of F to be the, just the same app the same analogous thing. So you just take G of QP, G of, G of ZP orbits on the GQP equivalence class of F. And then we just define MP of F to be summation G in BP of F. The stabilizer in GQP of G divided by the stabilizer GZP of G, then the result is that M of F is the product over all primes P and P of F. So I'm going to sketch the proof. It's very short. It's very simple, actually. So what we're going to do is we're going to. The point is we will we, we have we have a map. If we take GQP, so let me define. GQ GQF, and similarly GQPF for any f in vq, for any f in vq, qp, just define it to be the set of elements in the group that, that keeps f integral. Same thing here. Then the point is that M of F is simply equal to the size of GQP F quotient out by GZP, while MP of F is, sorry, so it's exactly what you expect. Now, we have a natural map to the product over all primes P. And this map is a bijection. since G has class number one. So in all our cases, the group G has class number one, and that allows us to prove that M of F is the product over all P of M P of F. You can modify this and do it, make it, make a, make whatever, you know, make the correct modifications when G doesn't have class number one, so that's it's it's not as if not being class number one is some sort of insurmountable difficulty, but when it has class number one, it's it's an extremely easy it's an extremely easy proof, very short. And so we we have this very nice a formulation of M of F as a local product of uh, as, as as just a local product of uh, functions defined over V Z P. So that tells us that if we want to go from counting GQP equivalence from GQP equivalence classes instead of GZ orbits, all we have to do is weight each GZ orbit by a function. And moreover, this function is nice in that it's a product of local functions.
So now we know what we want to do. We want to count. Um, we want to count elements. So in Vz, discriminant is plus or minus, irreducible, R soluble, height less than x, and we want to count Gz orbits here. But we want to weigh them by 1 by m of f times I'll write it as L of f, where L of f is 1 if f is locally soluble and 0 if f is not locally soluble. So we're also imposing additional PID conditions by insisting that f actually be locally soluble. <laughs> and the great thing is that L of f divided by m of f is just a local product. LP of f divided by MP of f, where LP of f is one if f is soluble at QP and zero else. So that's very nice. Instead of counting lattice points, we're counting lattice points weighted by some function. And this function is not something completely crazy. It's, it's, it's a local function. It's a, it's, a, it's a function that comes from piecing together local functions. OK. So how do we do that? How do we, instead of counting lattice points, count lattice points with some weight? Now, first of all, I'll note that in general, this is an extremely difficult problem. I mean, if you want to, if you want to count lattice points weighted by some function, that function better have some kind of structure. In our case, it has a structure of being a local product. That's fine. There are methods developed to do that. But all the same, I'll note that summing up functions, you know, where which are defined by product of by a local product can also be very difficult. For example, the simplest lattice is Z. And we know how to count points in Z, the number of elements in Z with height, with, with like size less than X, like number of integers between one and X is approximately X. That's nice. I mean, it's a floor of X. However, suppose instead we want to weigh each integer by the Mobius function. I mean, that's an extremely difficult thing, even though the Mobius function is, well, I guess the Mobius function isn't. Yeah, the Mobius function is, is a local function. It's, 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 a, it's a product where you multiply by one if P does not divide N and you multiply by minus one if P does divide N, you multiply by zero if P squared divides N. But summing up the Mobius function is extraordinarily difficult. It's equivalent to the prime number theorem. So in general, just summing up even a product of local functions of an arbitrary lattice is a very difficult question. However, in our case, we have the following important result, which is again very easy. It's quite easy here to verify, which is that LP of f divided by MP of f is equal to one unless p squared divides the discriminant of f. So for example, if, if the discriminant of f is square free, sorry, I wrote v here when I meant f, of course. For example, if the discriminant of f is square free, then uh, LP, L, LP of f divided by MP of f is always one, which means L of f divided by M of f is one. So our problems only occur when squares of primes divide the discriminant. So in order to carry this out, in order to evaluate the sum, OK, 
Okay. Oh. To evaluate the sum, we have to essentially say that prime squares don't very often divide the discriminant. So, so you can evaluate the sum using some theoretic methods, but what we need to make them work is what's called a tail estimate. And in arithmetic statistics, they're often called a uniformity estimate. And I'll note that uniformity estimates are very difficult to do in general. So for example, this is one part of this machinery I mean, the parameterization is something that only works in specific cases. With the geometry of numbers, by now the machinery is very good and can handle pretty much any finite dimensional representation of a reductive group. Um, these sort of periodic methods to go between to go between um, z orbits in Q-equivalence classes work in great generality, but the uniformity, uniformity estimates don't work in generality. Like you have to do them case by case and they're often very difficult. There are still many spaces for which we just don't know how to answer this question. But what is this question? So I'll tell you what we need. What we need is an estimate of the following form. We need to say, okay, let's take V of Z. Let's take elements with height less than X. And let's take only those elements where P squared divides the discriminant of F. Okay, and let's count G and Z orbits, or let's count G Z orbits of this. So as we'll see in a moment, the total number of orbits, if you didn't, if, you, if, if we didn't have the condition P squared divides discriminant F, the total amount would look something like X to the five by six. That's the way our height is normalized. Our height is normalized so that if you're counting orbits with height less than X, you get X to the five by six elements. Well, now we are imposing the additional condition that P squared divides the discriminant. So that should happen with density approximately one by P squared. So what we need, sorry, so what we expect to be true is something like this. This is very difficult to prove. Instead, what we say, well, I mean, what you need is something weaker. You need this, but only on average. You need this only on average over. So we need this only on average over P. So we need this only on average over P. So you can say let's P go from capital M to 2M. So now we expect x to the 5 by 6 divided by m to be the asymptotic. But we need something even weaker than this, it turns out. All we need is an m to the delta plus big O of x to the 5 by 6 minus theta for any delta and theta that are bigger than 0. What we need is actually much weaker than what we ex expect to be true, but even this weaker statement is actually quite difficult to prove. But, um, but this is what we need in order to evaluate, evaluate this sum. So I'm not quite sure how much to say about these uniform estimates. There's a long history of trying to prove it. If you're trying to carry out a square free sieve, you need to prove these estimates. And there's a long history of doing this. So maybe what I will do is I'll just sketch out a proof of a very quick proof and a very strong uniformity estimate for what happens when you're counting elliptic curves. So, so let me, so let's, let's, 
let's look at this again. So, so recall our family of elliptic curves. Things of the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. And I'll call this polynomial f of x. And we have a height. is max of 4a cubed and 27b squared. So the number of points in E with height less than x is something like x to the 5 by 6, because A must be less than x to the 1 by 3 approximately, and B must be less than x to the 1 by 2. Multiplying them together, we get approximately x to the 5 by 6 elliptic curves with height less than x. But now, let's instead just try and count these polynomials. So I'll, I'll also do, denote this to be the height of f. The discriminants of f and eib are the same. So let's instead try and count the number of points, uh, the number of elements such that p squared divides the discriminant and we expect to get x to the 5 by 6 by p squared but that's that's not known that's still an open question to actually get to actually prove that this number is x to the 5 by 6 by p squared is bounded by x to the 5 by 6 by p squared i think that's still not known however let me just give you this very nice proof for how you can do this on average. Um, this is due to uh, this is due to uh, Anand Shankar. Uh, myself and Jerry Wang. It's a very very quick, very quick proof. The point is that instead of e, you can think about f. And instead of f, you can think about the ring that you get from f. And let's call this ring rf. And instead of rf, you can think of, you can, you can, you can think of the field of fractions of rf. Like ignore the reducible elements, there are very few reducible elements. You can think of the fraction field. And inside this, we have a ring of integers, OF. Now, suppose P squared divided the discriminant of F for some p between m and 2m. Then what does that mean? This means p squared divides the discriminant of rf Now the height of f is less than or equal to x by assumption, which implies, it's easy to check that the discriminant of rf is, is less, less than some constant times x. Um, okay, you have to be a little bit more careful here. But it turns out that if p divides, you have to be a little bit more careful here. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to, in fact, so, so the thing is, so this is actually a very important concept that was introduced by by Manjul Bhargava, uh, which is that if p squared divides the discriminant of f, it can happen for two reasons. Suppose p squared divides the discriminant of f, it can either happen for mod p reasons. So an example of a mod p reason is just both a and b are divisible by p. If both a and b are divisible by p, then p squared can divide the discriminant. And that's a condition that can be checked just by reducing mod p. So this is an extremely 
so extremely important uh, sort of way of thinking about this, which is that if when p squared divides some polynomial, it can either do so for mod p reasons, or or it does so for mod p squared reasons. And um, work of Ekedal and Bhargava, like using sorry, I should I should say that like using the Ekedal self. Bhargava handles these mod p conditions in great generality. Like using the Ekadal sieve, you can essentially prove these uniformity estimates for mod for the mod p cases, and you can prove them in almost every case. But the mod p squared cases are still completely unknown and you have to do them case by case. So here, suppose P squared divides the discriminant of RF, sorry, for mod P squared, for mod P squared reasons, what this means is that P divides the index of RF inside OF. Got this wrong. I never remember the order. OF contains RF, which implies that the discriminant of OF, which is the same as the discriminant of KF, is less than x divided by p squared. Because the discriminant of RF is x, and then we have a mod p squared. And then, and then we have p. We have an index p squared thing, and we have an index p thing inside it. So the number of such fields, and remember, the, and p is between m and two m. So this is less and less than x divided by m squared. So the number of such fields kf. is less than less than x divided by m squared. That's the total number of such fields. So that's very small. So this, the fact that this is true is the Davenport Hilbron theorem. That the number of fields with discriminant bounded by x is grows like x. So the number of such fields is less and less than x divided by m squared. But a field can correspond to many different f's. So we're taking a set of f's. And we're mapping it to the set of fields. We've shown that the number of such fields is bounded by x by m squared. But there could be many fibers. So the point is, it's not enough to just count fields. We need to count fields weighted by the number of f's that can show up. But f basically corresponds. to an element in the field it belongs in. Namely, I mean, what is k, right? k is just simply, uh, I should say, k is simply qx mod f of x. And so in particular, k contains x, and x determines f. So to count the number of f's, all we need to do is count the number of cubic fields weighted by the number of different elements having small height. So using this idea, we can prove that if you sum uh, p between m and 2m, 
the number of elliptic curves whose discriminants are divisible by p squared is less than less than x to the 5 by 6 divided by m. I guess we'll add a plus big of, I think, x to the 1 by 2 or something. So that's the flavor for how, I mean, so like for some uniformity estimates. In the higher cases, the way these uniformity estimates are proved, I already told you that the mod p reasons is handled using work of Bhargava and gray generality. So the mod p squared reasons are what are left. So, so in many of these cases, what you do is you look at an element whose discriminant is divisible by p squared for mod p squared reasons. And then you move it around using this group that's acting to make the discriminant divisible by, by mod p reasons. And, and you prove the uniformity estimate that way. So I don't have time at all to go into this. So let me not do that. And let me instead proceed towards, let me instead, so this has been, I don't know, this is a, I'm not sure how useful it was, but it's an interlude on, on, on the uniformity estimates that we need to evaluate the sum that we actually care about. But remember the sum that we actually care about was, was this. We want to count points inside we want to count gz orbits on vz and we want to weight by this function. So suppose we prove the uniformity estimates, what shape does the answer take? So let me talk about that. So may I ask a question? Of course. You said that the number of fields is x over m squared, but you got uh, a final answer that had x to the 5 6 so how did the exponent get reduced or did you assume that M was large compared to X? Oh, you're right. We have to, I mean, like, see, if M is very small, then you don't have to, you don't have to worry about this at all because then you can just, as long as, as long as P squared is less, so let's, let's say M here must be greater than um, X to the one by four. I see. Because if m is less than x to the one by four, then you can just count by hand because your mod p squared conditions, like a is a complete range from one to p squared, and so and so you can just count it without any without any issues. Oh, of course, yeah, absolutely. But this is a very very good point. You're right. This this theorem is, um, uh, yeah. So 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 when m is small, you count by hand. When m is large, you use this you use this uh, idea. Absolutely. Okay, um, great question. Um, let me move on to the final to the final thing. So if you'll remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to count um, GQ orbits or GQ equivalence classes on VZ. We want it to be locally soluble. We want it to be irreducible. And we want the height to be less than X. Now this is basically equal to the sum. So GN and VN. So this is basically equal to the sum over elliptic curves with height less than X. And we're summing by the parameterization result, the size of the n Selma group of E, except because we're counting irreducible elements and not all elements, we have to subtract one because we've thrown out the elements that correspond to the identity element. If you know how to count the identity element of elliptic curves, that's not a problem. So here we're counting all the non-identity elements and it's equal to this. Now, suppose we have a uniformity estimates, then this is going to be equal to the number of GZ orbits. And we know what that number is. It's one by the size of the two torsion, depending on the discriminant or the n torsion rather.
times the volume of f dot rx plus minus is the fundamental domain that we had constructed last time. Times we've imposed, I mean, this is what would happen if we were just counting gz orbits and we were not imposing the local solubility condition. But now we're weighing by all these different functions. So if we can do a sieve, then it turns out that this is not equal. This will just be an asymptotic times a product over all primes P of the volume, which is the integral in VZP, LP of F divided by MP of F, DF. So we have to, we have to multiply by the density. Right, like we're weighing by some function, you have to multiply by the density. Now it turns out that the way we compute, so this is some set inside VR, this is some integral over VZP. So you have to compute an Archimedean volume and we have to compute all these sphadic volumes and we have to multiply them together. And it turns out the way to do this very cleanly is to is is to use this incredible um, Jacobian change of variables that seems to hold for all these for all these co-regular representations. Um, it's a bit of a coincidence that it holds, but it but it does hold. So what what we have is we have. So, I mean, like, what was the setup, right? We had GN, we had VN, and then we had the invariant space. So the invariant space I'll call inf, and it's basically affine two space. And so, so it turns out that, like, so, so if, if, if you let K be R or QP for some P, and then you take K squared, so that's basically the inf, right? These are the pairs A comma B that show up, the invariants that show up. And suppose you take a section from K squared. So let's, let's take an open ball inside K squared. And let's take a section into Vn of K. So for example, these sets Rx plus minus that we constructed are such sections. Like Rx contains either contains like one or two points depending on depending on whether your um depending on, on the discriminant. So it's either one section or two sections. So it has one or two points for each pair of invariants. So it's basically the image of a section. So let's take a section from B to V and K. We'll call it sigma. Now, if you take sigma b, that's a set inside v and k. This is what Rx is basically. And if you take some ball g naught inside gn, or rather, I'm saying it this way. Let me just say it. Um, let me just say that if you just take, we have a map from g of k to the cross section to v of k. In fact, I'll think of it, I'll think of it as, as just a map from g of k cross b to v of k, where of course gamma cross a pair of invariants I guess B wasn't the best choice for a ball. I'll take script B instead. So if you take gamma and you take a pair of invariants that sent to gamma acting on sigma of A comma B. So this is a map. So it turns out that the Jacobian change of variables
for this map is some rational constant. The rational non-zero constant. Which means instead of computing volumes inside VR, you can translate it to volumes over uh, G cross the invariant space. And instead of computing integrals in VZP, you can pull back to integrals over GZP cross the invariant space. So if we apply this Jacobian change of variables, what we get is really nice. So first of all, let me tell you what the infinite place is. So the volume of f dot rx plus minus, and I'll remember the, that we are dividing by the size of the stabilizer. This is just going to be, so there's the Jacobian change of variables. There's going to be the volume of f. That is going to be the volume of the, the, the just inside the invariant space, like, so, so this is just basically, we're just taking R squared. We're taking points in R squared with height less than X. And we're taking points with discriminant is either positive or negative. And for each, for each such element in R squared, we, are, we had some number of elements in Rx plus minus. How many elements did we have? Like, I mean, Rx plus minus is basically a union of sections from, 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 from R squared. And, and, the, and, and the number of sections, this again, we saw before, though I, I realized by this point, it may have, may have faded from the memory, but the number of sections was exactly the number of elements in E plus minus R quotiented by two E plus minus R. Again, depend, this, the, the size of this only depends on, only depends on the discriminant of E. So it turns out there's gonna be this times uh, the volume of this region. So let's call this region SX. So it's volume of SX times this quantity, which I'll call tau plus minus, tau infinity plus minus, where tau infinity plus minus is simply the number of elements in E plus minus R, quotiented by two E plus minus R, divided by the size of E plus minus R two. So this is the infinite contribution. And now it turns out that this quotient doesn't depend on whether the discriminant is plus or minus. This quotient is independent of the discriminant. So I'll just call it tau infinity. So the infinite contribution basically is just this Jacobian change of variables times the volume of F times the volume of Sx. That's the infinite contribution times tau, tau infinity. And I take it that these twos are secretly ands? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I keep thinking of the two Selma case because that's where we actually did all this and everything else we just cited it. But yes, it's, it's, it, you're absolutely right. These twos are n. The two in the exponent here is always a two, two invariants. Okay, what about the piadic contribution? So the piadic contribution, if you'll remember, was integral over VZP, LP of F divided by MP of F, DF. And if you compute this using the same Jacobian change of variables, we get again this Jacobian at P times the volume of GZP times 
something that's very nice, namely um, something which I call tau p, where tau p is the exact analog. It's just the number of elements in EQP mod n EQP divided by the number of elements in EQP n. And the point is that this doesn't depend on E. So you get the same tau p. If you had some crazy family where this did depend on E, which can sometimes happen in, the, in the certain abelian varieties, then you have to actually integrate this quantity and it's more complicated. Here it's just constant all the way through. And so this is just all we get. That's, that's the periodic contribution. So therefore, what's the total? What sum E in EX plus minus I should put a plus minus for the SX because that depends on the sign of the discriminant. Number of elements in the n Selma group of E minus one. This is therefore asymptotic to this local, to this product over all P's times this. We highlight it. We used a highlighter before. So we're going to take this infinite contribution and multiply it by the product over all P of this PID contribution. But, the, but J times JP over all P is just one by the product formula. So this will cancel out. Turns out that tau infinity tau times tau P over all P is also one. So that cancels out. Volume of F times the volume of GZPs for all P is exactly the Tamagawa number And the volume of Sx, which is the last thing that's left, is basically the number of elements, the number of elliptic curves that there are at all. So if instead we take the average value, then this is what we get. Average size, so this implies that, so this is the last, so I'll end of this theorem. The average size of the n Selma groups, so this is for n equals two, three, four, five. I was, okay. I'm only doing this for two, three, and five, I'm afraid. What I said is slightly incorrect for four. I'll explain why in a second, but 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 the average size of the two Selma, the three Selma, and the five Selma is basically is 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 n plus one. Because there's a plus one coming from here, and it turns out the Tamagawa numbers of the groups G2 is two, of the group G3 is three, and the group G5 is five. Now, if you're looking for the four Selma group. The Tamagawa number is four. However, however, when we threw out the reducible elements, we didn't throw out only the identity element. We did throw out the identity elements. We would add a one, but we also threw out elements of order two. The irreducible elements were elements of exact order four. So we also threw out the elements of order two. And the number of elements of, and the average number of elements of order two, we've already computed in the two Selma groups. So we've got to add a plus two. Okay, so I will um, I will end here and take your questions. Thank you very much. So, uh, are there any questions or comments?
So uh, can I ask you something? Uh, the, the last theorem, uh, in the last theorem, n is equal to, to five. So do, do you expect uh, the same formula for uh, general n or primes? Absolutely. So it is a conjecture of Poonen and Reigns that the average n Selma group is just the sum of divisors of n. I see, thank you. And, and in fact, they conjecture the whole distribution. So not just the average, but also all the higher moments. Oh, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Uh, uh, so, yeah, I, my question was kind of related to this. So there's this Poonen Reigns um, uh, conjecture. And then on the other end, you pointed out in one of the lectures that things get pretty out of hand once n becomes large. So what should be an approach for n, like given this two, what should be an approach for a general n, like? I mean, or oh, large an approach n. to prove the full Poonen range conjecture. I mean, or even just anything? the average size for n large. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. So I one, don't know, one just thing... a wild question, maybe, sorry. I mean. No, no, it's a great question. Sometimes the most important question in this field, like one of the, like this kind of thing, you know, because in a lot of recent results in arithmetic statistics have come from, have come from these very explicit parameterizations that just don't seem to exist. And they seem to exist only for very special cases. So one approach is to just find new parameterizations. Like that's where we're stuck in some sense. So we know how to parameterize N Selma, so, 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 I mean, one thing is just find a group acting on a lattice where the lattice with some orbits correspond to elements of the N Selma group. If we can do that and we can count, then we're in very good shape. So you can look for good parameterizations. Another thing is we do have some parameterizations. Mm -hmm. Like we know, for example, like, like we, you can parameterize it as uh, someone previously mentioned the work of Landisman and, 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 um, and, and, and Eric Raines. You can, you can parameterize this stuff in terms of varieties and over function fields, you can, you can do point counts on those varieties using cohomology methods. If, for example, we could parameterize them using some nice varieties for which we do have some approach, some sort of affine homogeneous varieties, something where you can use dynamics kind of methods, then that would be, that would be an approach to try and count points on the corresponding varieties that actually show up. There's another, I mean, like other things you can do is you can try and find like one of the great things about this parameterization is that the height of the points that we were, that, that parameterize the objects, like if you have an elliptic curve of height X, the height of the point that parameterizes an element in the Enselma group is pretty small. Suppose you're willing to drop that condition and allow for parameterizations with much larger height. Then you can sometimes construct such parameterizations as well, but then you have to pay a cost if you're not counting all lattice points, you're only counting very a sparse set of lattice points. And sometimes that set is defined, for example, by congruence conditions, mod large numbers. And so that would be another, another approach as well. But yeah, mm -hmm. those absolutely. Thank you. I think there is a question from chat. Can, can you? Oh, wonderful. Is this formula also true over some particular? Yeah, so absolutely. So, I mean, I mean, the two infinity Selma of families of elliptic curves that are quarter twist has been completely handled by groundbreaking work of Alex Smith. So you certainly expect this formula to be true in most cases, unless there's some 
special algebraic reason for why things should be a little bit different. You certainly expect this formula to be true. If you take a if you take a random elliptic curve, you take a family of quadratic twists. You do expect the Poon and Raine's heuristics to hold absolutely. In fact, I mean, in their heuristics, they don't really assume. I mean, I mean, there's no there's no I mean, there's no reason they're same. Re their reasoning for making the heuristic will also hold. If, if instead of the full family of elliptic curves, you have a family of, of, of twists, for example. So we do expect that, absolutely. That's great. That's great. Uh, another question or comments? I'd like to um, also, oh sorry, I'd just also uh, like to thank the organizers for for for, um, for this great conference. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, sir, uh, yes. can this be done for a hyperreality curve, like for Genus 2 or Genus 3? Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of, there's been a lot of, quite a lot of work on this. So not all Selmers, but the two Selmer group of hyperelliptic curves with a marked Weierstrass point is, has been done by work of Bhargava and Gross. If instead you mark a non Weierstrass point, that's also been done by, uh, that's been done by, by myself and Jerry Wang. If you have two marked points, then that's work of Anand Shankar. Um, there are many other families of hyperelliptic curves and some families of non hyperelliptic curves. There are work of Jack Thorne, Beth Romano, Jeff Laga, some wonderful works there. Um, if you just look at a random hyperelliptic curve, even degree, then you don't actually, most of the time you expect it to have no points at all. So, I mean, it's not quite the Selma group that you're looking at. Like you, part of the reason you're interested in these Selma groups, for hyperelliptic curves is to try and understand the distribution of rational points on them. And, um, and work of Manjul Bhargava shows that most hyperlipticals don't have any rational points. Uh, so there's a lot of, there's a very extensive literature on, um, on understanding points in Selma groups of, in families of hyperlipticals, absolutely. For this uh, results, you have done for n equal to two, three, four, five. So no, just this... n equal to two. Sorry, for hyperelliptic curves, it's only n equal to two. That's known. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Uh, are there any others? Uh, if not, uh, let's thank the speaker for the series of wonderful lectures. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, and thanks also to the organizers for organizing a wonderful workshop.